Good morning. I'm Bill Brown, pastor of Ruffner Memorial Presbyterian Church in Charleston, West Virginia. It's been a quiet week at Ruffner. Work on the boiler progresses, but its completion appears to be several weeks away. The chamber orchestra had its first rehearsal in a gymnasium on Tuesday, and while it was cool, the temperature was tolerable. St. Michael Church is meeting in the chapel and will conduct the flowering of the cross on Easter morning. Everyone who would like to attend is invited. Kathy and I are scheduled to receive our second vaccine on the 3rd of April. Botany and the mall have now had their first shots. Slowly but surely, we as a congregation are becoming immunized. It's amazing to me that anyone who doesn't have a medical reason wouldn't get the vaccine. After all, it's free. It's as simple as calling the local health department and making an appointment just to have the first shot and some immunity is a great relief. The sooner we all have the vaccine and achieve herd immunity, the sooner it will be safe for us to meet back in the church again. This is no time to let up. Wear your masks. They are effective. We haven't had a flu epidemic this year, partially due to masks and physical distancing. Stay well and stay in touch with each other. Pray with me, will you? Lord, we confess we love our lives as they are. We struggle with every idea of change. We wrestle with the thought of doing things differently. But we know that the life we cling to is only half a life. Only you, Lord, can give us true life in full. Forgive us for holding on to the wrong things. Teach us by your Spirit to let go of our agendas and aspirations. Help us to let go of our self-righteousness and false notions of power. Give us the strength and courage to try new things so long as they agree with your will. Encourage us to let go of ourselves so we can fully embrace you. For we pray these things in the name of our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
Our scripture this morning comes from the Message Translation, from the Gospel of John, the 12th chapter, the 20th through the 33rd verse. There were some Greeks in town who had come up to worship at the feast. They approached Philip, who was from Bathsheba in Galilee. Sir, we want to see Jesus. Can you help us? Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip together told Jesus. Jesus answered, Time's up. The time has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Listen carefully. Unless a grain of wheat is buried in the ground, dead to the world, it is never any more than a grain of wheat. But if it's buried, it sprouts and reproduces itself many times over. In the same way, anyone who holds on to to life just as it is destroys that life. But if you let it go, reckless in your love, you'll have it forever, real and eternal. If any of you wants to serve me, then follow me. Then you'll be where I am ready to serve at a moment's notice. The Father will honor and reward anyone who serves me. Right now, I am shaken. And what am I going to say? Father, get me out of this? No, this is why I came in the first place. I'll say, Father, put your glory on display. A voice came from the sky. I have glorified it, and I'll glorify it again. The listening crowd said thunder. Others said an angel has spoken to him. Jesus said, the voice didn't come for me, but for you. At this moment, the world is in crisis. Now Satan, the ruler of this world, will be thrown out, and I as I am lifted up from the earth, will attract everyone to me and gather them around me. He put, he put this, he put it this way to show how he was going to be put to death. This is the word of the Lord. None of the other gospels tell this story. John's gospel was the gospel written to present the truth of Christianity in a way that the Greeks could appreciate and understand it. It is natural that in it, the first Greek Gentiles should be recorded wanting to see Jesus. It shouldn't seem strange to find Greeks in Jerusalem at Passover. Greeks were great wanderers. They were driven to find out new things. Some ancient writer said, perhaps with tongue in cheek, the Athenians will never rest yourselves, nor will you ever let anyone else rest. Another writer said, you Greeks are like children always young in your souls. More than 500 years earlier, Herodotus, the Greek historian and traveler of the known world, as, uh, as he said, to find out things. But the Greeks were more than that. They were seekers of truth. The Greeks were people hungry in their intellects. How did these Greeks come to hear of Jesus and become interested in him? Archbishop J. H. Bernard advanced an interesting suggestion. It was in the last week of Jesus' ministry that he cleansed the temple and drove out the money changers and merchants. Now these traders were in the court of the Gentiles, the great court which was the first of the temple's many courts, and where 
the Gentiles were allowed to come, even if no further. Perhaps they had been present when Jesus took his action, or perhaps they had only heard about it. It's speculation, but an interesting thought. However it may be, this is one of the great moments of the gospel story. For there is a hint that Jesus' story will go out to the entire world. Perhaps our group of Greeks were a God-fearing group of Gentiles who have come to observe the great feast of Passover. We simply don't know. They approached Philip with the request to see Jesus, but to their credit, they didn't just want to physically see Jesus. Having heard and perhaps observed him, they wanted to meet him and to know him. Now we read in verse 20, now there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip was perhaps unsure what he should do and went to Andrew, and in turn, Andrew and Philip to Jesus. Interestingly enough, we are not told that the people who made this request actually did see Jesus although I believe it highly likely they did. They came originally to Philip, possibly because Philip is a Greek name that means the lover of horses. Andrew is also Greek and means manly. So these Greeks, many, these Greeks may have been more comfortable with them because of their Greek names. When Philip went to Andrew, Andrew knew exactly what to do. Every time we meet him in the Gospels, he is bringing someone to Jesus. So it's implied, at least, that the Gentiles got their meeting with Jesus. Now, the first part of Jesus' response is surprising. He says, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Up to this point, his disciples have heard him say, my hour has not yet come. That first occurred at the wedding feast at Cana, when his mother asked him to do something about the feast running out of wine. Jesus said to her, my hour has not yet come. But of course he acquiesced and did as his mother asked. In the seventh chapter of John, Jesus tells his brothers to go up to the feast at Jerusalem, but he was not going because, he said, my hour has not yet come. And in the eighth chapter, as he was speaking in Jerusalem, and already the opposition, opposition against him was beginning to form, John says, no man laid hands on him to arrest him because his hour had not yet come. Yet now, when a few strangers come and Jesus is told that they want to see him, suddenly, to the disciples' surprise, he seems greatly moved with emotion and says, Now my hour has come. The time has come for me to be glorified. This event seems to be to Jesus like a great clock striking the hour, a, moment, a momentous moment in his life when all he had lived for now has come to fulfillment. What Jesus makes clear is that the coming of the Greeks in some way communicated that the end, the climax of his life's work on earth was at hand. Because verse 23 says, 
But Jesus answered them, saying, The time has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. William Barclay, the great Scottish theologian, said, To the Jews, the Son of Man stood for the undefeated world conqueror sent by God. So when Jesus says, The hour has come that the Son of Man must be glorified, when he said that, the listeners would have would have to catch their breath. They meant that the subjected kingdoms of the earth would grovel before the conqueror's feet. But by glorified, Jesus meant crucified. When the Son of Man is mentioned, they thought of the conquest of the armies of God. He meant the conquest of the cross. The first sentence which Jesus spoke would excite the hearts of those who heard it. Then began a succession of sayings which must have left them struggling and bewildered by their sheer incredibility, for they spoke not of, in terms of conquest, but in terms of sacrifice and death. We will never understand Jesus, nor the attitude of the Jews to him, until we understand how he turned their ideas upside down. When Jesus says he will be glorified, he means that he will be crucified. In that way, his real glory will be revealed. In verse 24, it begins with, Most assuredly, but I like the King James Version better, which says, Verily, verily, I say, or some other translations have it truly, truly. Whenever we read these words, it should alert us to pay attention to whatever Jesus says next because it's of great importance. Now having gained everyone's attention, Jesus goes on to say three amazing paradoxes. First, life comes through death. I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. This statement, of course, applied to himself. Jesus used the image of a seed to illustrate the spiritual truth that there can be no fulfillment of life without death, no victory without surrender. In and of itself, the seed is a weak and use, useless thing but when it's planted and dies, it fulfills its purpose. First of all, Jesus speaks of his own death. Jesus died on behalf of others that they might be the first fruits of his death. The simple truth is, if he does not die, we cannot live. His death is what produces the fruit of life. Warren Wiersbe, the great preacher, said, Christians are like seeds. They are small and insignificant, but they have life in them, God's life. However, that life can never be fulfilled unless they yield themselves to God and permit Him to plant them. We must die to self so that we may live for God. The only way to have a, fulfill, uh, have a fulfilled life is to follow Jesus Christ. Perhaps our problem is that we are storing grain in barns, hoarding the seeds, protecting them in places we call churches. The parable of the rich man is not just about materialism. 
It's about hoarding what what could be used as beneficial for others in need. I used to look forward to this time of year. It's each spring I planted a very large vegetable garden. It provided produce to my grandparents, my parents, and to my family. We not only had fresh vegetables, but had plenty to can and freeze for the entire winter. We also were able to share with our neighbors. One summer I planted so many tomatoes, we had no way to use them all. So I gave them to our neighbors until they said, Uncle, enough. Well, I grew up in a family where you didn't waste food. I stopped asking the neighbors if they would like tomatoes and just left them a bag of tomatoes on their front porch late at night sometimes with a note that said, I hope you can use these. If not, please give them to someone who can. If you've ever bought seed packets at a nursery or hardware and looked at the back, you'd notice that they had a, a date for the 2021 season, for instance. That's because if you don't plant the seeds, they will lose their ability to germinate about 10% the first year, and more and more each year thereafter. To fulfill their purpose, the seeds must be planted. Second, life comes to spending it. Jesus said, he who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. We have to stop controlling, grasping, and hanging on to our own life, our own security. We are called to a place, to place higher value on eternal things than on the things of this earth. If then you are raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. The truth is that we lose everything that we associate with this life at some point. It's just a matter of time. We can't hold on to our youth no matter how hard we try. We can't hold on to our athletic ability, no, how, no matter how hard we try. We can't hold on to mental capacity. We can't even hold on to our loved ones. It's just a matter of time. But Jesus tells us to start now. He tells us not to focus on, on grabbing and keeping what we have now. The Dutch Christian writer, Corey Ten Boom said, I have learned to hold all things loosely so God will not have to pry them out of my hands. She said that it is less painful to hold loosely to the things of this world so that God does not have to take them from you. In one of his books, Watchman Nei, the Chinese Christian writer, said that he approached God like a little child with open hands begging for gifts. Because God is good, he fills our hands with good things, life, health, friends, money, success, recognition, challenge, marriage, children, a home, a job all the things we count as blessings at Thanksgiving. So like children, we rejoice in what we have, what we've received, and run around comparing what we have with each other. When our hands are finally full, God says, my child, I long to have fellowship with you. 
reach out your hand and take mine. But we can't because our hands are full. We just can't. Put those things aside and take my hand, he says. No, we can't. It's too hard to put them down. But I'm the one who gave them to you in the first place. Oh God, what you have asked is just too hard. Please don't ask us to put these things aside. But God answers quietly, you must. God orchestrates the affairs of our lives to bring us to a place where our faith will be in Him alone. Slowly, but surely, as we go through life, He weans us away from the things of this world. Dr. Ray Pritchard wrote, At first, the process touches our possessions, but eventually it touches our relationships and then it touches our loved ones, and finally it touches life itself, until finally there is nothing left but God and us. Third, greatness comes through service. The Bible says, if anyone serves me, let him follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my Father will honor. The Bible says that we are servants of the Most High God. I wonder if it has ever dawned on us how very important that title is. God could not give you a higher honor than to call you one of his servants. I want you to think about this because I think that a lot of people have the idea that when they talk about serving the Lord, that somehow they are taking a step downward. But Jesus came as a servant, willing to do whatever was necessary in order to move people and to bring them to his saving knowledge. In John, the 13th chapter, we read about the Last Supper. Jesus is sitting at the table with his disciples. And if you, if you recall what Jesus did next, it must amaze you. He got a basin of water and knelt down and washed their feet. Remember how Peter re reacted? He objected. But Jesus was taking the form of the lowest servant, a bond servant, and washing the dirty feet of his disciples. He saw himself as a servant of the Father and a servant of the very ones he was saving. We would see Jesus, the Greek said. How do we see him? How do we see ourselves? And how do we serve him? Amen. And now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you both now and forevermore.